Okay, so what I will do now is, in the one hour, I suppose, we will go over planet by planet in the solar system, discuss the evidence that was obtained so far, and talk about future research and what questions are open and what are unknowns. What are the unknowns? As you know, we distinguish between two families of planets, the terrestrial or solid planets, planets that have a solid surface. And these are Earth, Venus, Mars, and Mercury. But I took the liberty of taking Mercury out of the family because it does not have an atmosphere per se. And instead I put, I put Saturn's largest moon, Titan, which is a the size of a planet, and it has an atmosphere. So this will be discussed in the context of lightning generation and, of course, the possibility for the early role lightning played in the biological evolution of life on those planets. So let's start by Venus. Venus. Uh, the brightest object in the sky except the sun and the moon and uh, usually appears before dawn or immediately after sunset. We don't see the Venusian surface because it is covered completely by clouds, dense, high clouds between 70 and 85 kilometers above the surface and they are made of sulfuric acid and uh, when we look at them in UV light, we see structure, we see stripes, we see uh, that it's not opaque. Because if we look at it with visible light, it's very hard to see anything. But um, recently several spacecraft flew very close by to Venus. We're able to take uh, sophisticated and well advanced images of what's going on on the planet. So this is kind, this slide summarizes most of our observations on Venus until now. Uh, so as I said, the temperature on the surface of Venus is extremely high. It is almost uh, in Kelvin, 700 degrees, that's 40, 450 Celsius on the surface and the pressure is 90 atmospheres, 90 times higher. So the atmosphere is very, very thick. And it is composed almost entirely of CO2, 95%, 3.5% molecular nitrogen, and the rest is water vapor and other gases. But this is a strictly carbon dioxide atmosphere. And many, many satellites and spacecraft attempted in different ways and through different sensors to look for lightning on Venus. The idea was Venus has an atmosphere. Venus is in the same size. <coughs> it's just 400 kilometers in diameter smaller than Earth. So it, it used to be known as the twin sister of Earth. People had those notions that, and I remember as a child reading books, <coughs> astronomy books of the 1960s, because little was known on Venus, it was just at the beginning of the space age, people called Venus the twin sister and they had this bizarre idea that it's closer to the sun, it's a little bit hotter, covered by clouds, maybe tropical conditions, jungles, dinosaurs, that kind of <laughs> reasoning was around Venus. And of course, when the first spacecraft data <coughs> arrived in the early 70s, we immediately understood that that's, there's no way that something can survive on the planet, on the surface of the planet. So still we were looking for lightning. Nothing was measured, contradicting detections 
of electromagnetic radiation, nothing was obviously seen by any instrument. And then uh, there was this uh, observation from an IR telescope, the NASA IRTF in Hawaii, where, as I mentioned, they were looking for chemical compounds. Remember, I said, uh, if we look for non-equilibrium or exotic kind of chemical compounds, they can tell us if there is lightning there or not, potentially. And that paper reported the existence of NO and other compounds that are long chain of C, H, O, N, and S. We call them charms. And um, so this, this is theoretical chemistry predicting what would be the abundance of NO in Venus's atmosphere if there were lightning there. And they do this reverse engineering and say, okay, our telescope sees this amount of NO as a function of altitude, around this altitude, which corresponds to the height of the clouds. So we can assume that the lightning rate on Venus is 90 strokes per second. That's higher than on Earth. On Earth it's just 50. And the density is 6 kilometers per kilometer square per year. That's a huge lightning rate. Problem is, we don't see those lightning. And so, this doesn't seem reasonable explanation. And probably there is another way to explain the existence of NO in the atmosphere. And then uh, the European Space Agency and NASA sent an orbiter to Venus called Venus Express, VEX. Venus Express orbits the planet takes continuous measurements. And what they were able to uh, measure was magnetic signals. Remember we talked about magnetic direction finder. So they were with their antenna on the spacecraft detected those magnetic signals coming from the planet. They did not see anything optical, no light emission, and yet they deduced uh, a flash rate very similar to the Earth, based on the repetition time of those magnetic signals. So that is not direct evidence, but uh, it's interesting. Why do we see so many signals why do we see chemical compounds and we don't see the light from lightning? So there was one work that tried to look for light in lightning on Venus from Earth. And this is a telescope situated in Arizona. And they were looking at Venus, the night side of Venus, of course, the day, day side would be much too bright. So you can look at the night side of Venus. And this guy, and this is the only evidence we have so far. So they found a couple of flashes. They looked long hours, long hours, and they found just here and there some bright pixels in the otherwise completely dark clouds that cover Venus. And this was a very conspicuous peak, so it's not something in the CCD of the telescope. It's something that occurs up in the atmosphere. And based on the longevity of the measurement, a couple of hours, and the very small repetition time, they calculated the global flash rate one thousandth of what is now on Earth. So, very little lightning, if at all. So you see, big disagreement between what spacecraft measure and what telescopes measure. 
that experiment of that was with a one meter telescope, one and a half meter. That's not a big one. So the, there's a Spanish team that repeated this concent this uh, concentrated effort to look for uh, lightning on Venus on the night side of Venus from Earth using a 10 meter 10 meter and a 3.5 meter bunch of telescopes in the Canary Islands of Spain that's in the Atlantic and nothing they found nothing and which is raising the suspicion that either lightning is very rare on Venus or very hard to detect certainly from Earth so for years this remained a challenge and then uh, a Japanese team launched a spacecraft called Akatsuki to Venus. Akatsuki is the Japanese name for the planet. Uh, I was part of that uh, team. We had a special camera on the spacecraft that was able to look for lightning and for sprites on Venus. Uh, we said maybe lightning occurs so deep in the clouds no photons are able to go out but if there is lightning there will be sprites below the ionosphere so let's look for sprites or lightning on Venus and that spacecraft was launched it should have orbited the planet at a very low height above the clouds however what happened was that the insertion maneuver to orbit around Venus failed and what happened was that the spacecraft was actually catapulted by the Venus gravitational field away from the planet and it just continued flying into the solar system and it took three years to get it back but even once they got it back to orbit the planet the orbit was much elongated and only very brief short periods were at close to the planet most of the time we were too far away from the planet and so we looked at the amount of data that we were able to see and in years of data we only had one event one bright event that we've seen in the data and we wrote a paper to nature submitted it and uh, it was sent for revision and my Japanese colleague who was the lead author had doubts that it's actually not lightning and we pulled the paper back we were not sure and so no conclusive evidence and recently a paper appeared by another group this is from August of this year very new paper I was actually re I reviewed that paper for JGR and those authors claim that all those bright events we've seen on Venus were actually meteors the title is meteors may masquerade as lightning in the atmosphere of Venus so when a bolide, a meteor, enters the atmosphere, it heats up the air for a very short period and emits a lot of light. And on Earth, we know to distinguish between a meteor light and a lightning light. Basically, they happen at different altitudes. Easy. On Venus, the meteors burn approximately where the clouds are, at 90 or 80 kilometers so those authors say that flashes from meteor fireballs are statistically likely to be created in the same intensity and frequency that we have seen those flashes of light that we interpreted as lightning so a, a, a summary paper before this one actually summarizes all the data that we have on Venus and I will make it brief no lightning we're pretty sure there's no lightning on Venus 
and I will explain the reason for that when we talk about Jupiter. Okay, so we didn't see lightning on Venus, we didn't see sprites on Venus, uh, and those chemical or electromagnetic signals may be coming from something else. Obviously, this was not uh, the case. However, something extremely interesting, not directly related to lightning, to this course, but since we are talking about life elsewhere, this was published in Nature two years ago. The discovery of phosphine gas <coughs> in the clouds of Venus from a telescope on Earth. Um, phosphine, PH3, you know, is considered to be biogenic by nature. At least on this planet, there are specific bacteria that produce this gas. And the authors suggested that the phosphine gas detected in the clouds of Venus is a proof for the existence of life in the clouds of Venus, which was a shock to everyone because obviously no one would have expected life to occur on the surface of the planet almost 400 degrees, 90 atmospheres, pressure, insane heat. But in the clouds, much more benevolent conditions, maybe there are lightning that push chemistry. You don't need, you don't need 50 flashes per second to start the chemical reaction. So maybe in the past, more lightning, some life forms evolved, some biology, occurred and now we see it as uh, phosphine. That paper was objected to and of course competing theories stating that the phosphine is created by photochemical processes, nothing biological. And um, so the debate is still going on. It's not related to the existence of lightning on Venus, it's related to what we can deduce on the chemi chemical reactions occurring in the atmosphere of this planet, is this biology or is it photochemistry? So this is a major issue in exobiology right now. It's a hot topic. So again, the paper was published a year and a half ago. It was debated. I won't say retracted, but objected, and alternative theories were published, and now new evidence shows up. This is from early July of this year. So the debate still goes on, and if you're interested, you can do a research and look up, up what uh, the scientific community thinks of. So this was Venus. Mars. We always talk about Mars as the best location to search for life because it's very close to uh, conditions of Earth as it was before. Um, it's now a desert, but although the temperature is very cold and the atmosphere is very thin, there are clouds, there are dust storms there, there are some frozen water as ice in the South and North Pole, and Mars is very active. There's action going on. We have landers on Mars. You can look up on the NASA Mars website. You can get images from Mars that were taken yesterday. And I remember it's, I was in Athens last year for uh, an astronomy meeting. It's called COSPA, COSPA, Committee on Space Application and Research. International meeting, amazing. And one of the keynote was was there life on Mars? It's not like the David Bowie thing, song, Life on Mars. It's, and I see many jokes and many memes on the web like life on Mars, water on Mars. So they take a Mars candy and put a glass of water and say water on Mars. <laughs> so funny. Uh, but there is water on Mars, obviously. And this guy was giving a, a fantastic keynote lecture and he told the audience, you know, uh, 
I thought uh, I would bring you the latest image from Mars. And he said that in the hotel he plugged into the NASA uh, repository, which was connected directly to the Mars Express spacecraft, downloaded the image from less than a day before and showed it to us. And I was kind of thinking to myself, what a magical age we live in, that you can get images from Mars in one day. When I did my PhD in Tel Aviv, I used NASA from the Voyager spacecraft, I will show you. That data was sent by mail, not email, mail. I got printouts from an IBC machine, uh, IBM machine, rows and rows of numbers that were sent by regular mail. And I had to work with those paper papers to do something, to compute anything. And now you get it in an instant. Fantastic. So we know there are dust storms on Mars. Dust particles are suspended in the air for long periods of time, rub against each other, produce electricity. So already people started doing the computation of, okay, let's suppose there is this dust devil or whirlwind or dust storm, how electrified will it be? And what would be the chance for electrical discharge in that dust cloud? And so we do the computation and we see that on Earth it takes, uh, the field is building higher, but because the surface pressure on Earth is so huge, the, the chance of anything electrical happening on Earth in a dust storm are quite low, although we measured this. But on Mars, the, the idea is that it can happen much readily and more easily. And so we expect that lightning, or at least some form of electrical spark, can be formed in a dust storm within 20 seconds. So this is a, a good idea for the generation of sparks on Mars in its present atmosphere. And my colleague from the UK, from the University of Bristol, Karen Applin, she showed that you can actually talk about a global circuit on Mars, similar to what we have on Earth, where on Mars the, the generator, instead of a thunderstorm, is a dust storm that generates electricity and then you will have ions flowing towards the surface and so you may have these gigantic dust storms that are electrified. And actually, if you have seen the movie The Martian with Matt Damon, did you see it? So do you remember the opening scene? How this kind of emergency occurs that uh, they have to live very quickly and he is stranded alone on Mars. You remember, that's the idea of how he survives alone on Mars. So the, the director, and actually the science fiction novel by Andy Veer tells that there was a huge dust storm that threatened their spacecraft and so they really hurried up, left in a hurry and forgot that he was still on the surface. But I'm telling you this not as a joke because the way they depicted the dust storm was really close to what we scientists forecasted. A huge cloud of dust with lightning inside. This is how it was perceived and it may actually be that there are electrical discharge on Mars. However, when we were looking for lightning from spacecraft, orbiting spacecraft, same as we did on Venus. Uh, we spent five years orbiting Mars and looking for specific radiation that should accompany Martian discharges and we found nothing. So theory and laboratory experiments predict that we can have Martian discharges in the dust, yet we haven't seen anything. So the bottom line is 
we don't know. There may be or may not be electrical discharges on Mars today. But if we look back on the early history of Mars and we reconstruct the chemical composition of the atmosphere, we see that Mars had running water, it had lakes, it had a water cycle, there were clouds, and the atmosphere was much denser. Today it's just six millibars. It's one over almost 150 compared to the Earth. Very diluted air. But back four billion years ago, three and a half billion years ago, Mars was wet and humid and probably stormy. There were rains, there were rivers, there were lakes. And if there were lightning there, in a parallel manner to the emergence of life, remember the Uri Miller kind of concept, may have happened on Mars as well. Same time it happened on Earth. No reason why it shouldn't. If you have the initial ingredients, let time do its work. You will have, eventually, biological compounds forming in the air, in lakes, in the water, generating this primordial soup we know, and maybe life emerged on Mars as well. I think this is the key question that NASA has in mind. We are going to Mars not to look for diamonds or for minerals. That's a story for industrialists to tell. We are looking for evidence for past or present life. Because as I said when I wrote the Drake equation, if we have life emerging on two planets, Earth and Mars, during their evolution, with the help of lightning, of course, then the universe is teeming with life everywhere because it seems like the probable thing to happen. Of course, I'm not talking about evolution and intelligence, communication. I'm just talking about biological life. So, this is why we are so interested in Mars. Now, the most interesting candidate that when I did my PhD, I thought to myself, that probably would be my next topic after I complete working on Jupiter, I want to look at Titan. Titan has a dense nitrogen, molecular nitrogen atmosphere, very similar to the Earth. We have 78%, where it's above 90. Of course, no oxygen, but already Voyager spacecraft was able to detect uh, several compounds uh, when it flew by Saturn and took a, mes a measurement of the uh, atmosphere of Titan. There are acetylene, cyanide, ethane, CO2, nitrogen, a family that is called hydrocarbons and nitriles. So all this already there, it's already there. Shall we look for biology on Titan? Although we know the surface is colder and no liquid water, but only liquid methane and ethane. So, okay, the ge geology will be different, but the chemistry may be the same for living creatures. <coughs> and so there was a joint European-American mission called the Cassini-Huygens spacecraft, which flew to Saturn, went into orbit, and parachuted a payload through the atmosphere. This is a cartoon and did measurements of the atmosphere. And um, we were looking for lightning, of, of course. Everybody was optimistic that we will find, because there were clouds. We knew there were clouds. This is a telescopic image of clouds on Titan that we see from the Hubble Space Telescope, from Earth practically. So it means that the atmosphere has clouds. And if we have clouds, it, we can do the calculation and see, uh, do we see any electricity there? And the sad result is that we saw nothing. 
big disappointment. No lighting on Titan. 72 orbits, close flybys. So either lighting activity is non-existent or very, very infrequent and weak, like Venus. On Venus, it may be that actually meteors were responsible for the signals we saw, and on Titan, we saw nothing. So, what's going on in Titan? And we are not sure. But then came another measurement <coughs> by the Huygens probe after they analyzed the data that was received. They found Schumann resonance frequencies that were in match with what would what we expect if there was lightning on Titan. <coughs> and so at, at first it was like, okay, we found the fingerprint, the electromagnetic signature of lightning in Titan. But after continued analysis of the data again and again, <coughs> it was deduced that it was produced by the spacecraft itself. It was a resonance between the antenna and the receiver on the spacecraft due to its passage of the ionosphere. And so, no, nothing on Titan. So from the four terrestrial candidates, Venus, likely not, Mars, maybe in dust storms, but not like lightning, we didn't see lightning. Titan, no. Earth, we already know. We know of a lot of lightning on Earth. So, Let's go to the giant planets, and this is a, looks like a modern painting of some really crazy artist. Reminds me of some parts of Salvador Dali's, you know, paintings, this convolution. Actually, this is a real image from the Juno spacecraft that is orbiting Jupiter. Isn't it amazing? It's so crazy how this atmosphere is complex and every structure that you see, thousands of kilometers large. Jupiter is a giant planet. The radius, I'm uh, sorry, the diameter is 140,000 kilometers. Earth is 12,800, right? So it's, it's a huge planet. It has several layers of clouds, deep water clouds covered by ammonium sulfate clouds, and then probably a haze and cirrus clouds of ammonia. We can ca calculate the altitude and do some calculation of where the clouds should be, how should they evolve, what would be the concentrations of particles. So we knew a lot of the clouds of Jupiter. and. There was a prediction that because of the dynamics and because <coughs> there was a hint of non-equilibrium compounds that were detected with a telescope actually in Israel uh, that looked on Jupiter and found this compound, acetylene, C2H2, that should not be in Jupiter. And the professor said, okay, there must be lightning on Jupiter. That was 1975. Nobody believed him, and it was considered like a theoretical prediction. But then in 1979, just four years later, the Voyager spacecraft, the two of them, flew by Jupiter on the night side, and they immediately detected lightning. Big, brilliant discharges on the night side. You can see huge in area. When you looked at the video, you saw how a lightning looks like. Not, well, on Earth, a couple of tens of kilometers square. I'm talking about flashes that illuminated clouds for hundreds and thousands of kilometers. When they calculated the energy of the lightning based on the light emission and the radiomagnetic emission that they had, they found out those are the strongest lightning on Earth still weaker than what we have on Jupiter. So these are 
thousand times more energetic. How does a planet produce such energetic lightning? That was the question. And uh, actually, this is what was my PhD all about. I started in, when did I start? 1991, maybe. <laughs> Probably you're not born then. Uh, and, uh, no, earlier, 1989. So, it took a year just to write a proposal and defend it. And I waited for the data to arrive. But what I did was a numerical model simulation of what a Jovian, a Jupiter thundercloud, would look like. And you write the equations and you take the data from the spacecraft about temperature, composition, humidity profile, and you run a simulation with what we know on Earth and just transport those equations to another world. And what we saw that, that you can actually develop really huge clouds these are 40, 50 kilometers big clouds, that dense, that contain a lot of water, hail, and ice. And when you have this kind of cloud, you can actually calculate the charge rate, like we did. And you can calculate how much lightning will be generated and what would be the energy. And I did this prediction. Uh, and um, when the Galileo spacecraft arrived in uh, Jupiter, my predictions were actually matching the, the energy that was calculated by the, uh, by the spacecraft. So it's not very often that you, as a theoretical physicist, give a prediction, and a few years later comes a spacecraft and confirms your prediction. So I was genuinely happy uh, but then, when I looked at this image from Juno that was released recently, I said, how na naive, how naive is your model compared to reality? I pictured a very simple cloud like a cylinder. <coughs> Look at this mess. This, you cannot simulate this. This is chaos in action. This is not the butterfly effect, this is the dragon effect, I don't know. Huge storm clouds, unimaginably complex, and yet they produce lightning, a lot of lightning. Every spacecraft that flew by Jupiter saw those lightning. Their global rate is not unlike that of Earth, maybe not 50 per second, but 10 per second, or 1 per second, but still a lot of lightning. and even very close to the North Pole, you see lightning. You remember on Tuesday I mentioned, when we discussed global distribution of lightning, that was on Wednesday, that we never see lightning close to the North Pole or South Pole. Only recently because of climate change. But on Jupiter, they occur near the pole. And actually this is a very puzzling uh, kind of a phenomena. We don't understand it quite well. Why? There are more lightning in mid-latitude and high-latitude, and there are almost nothing in the equator. On Earth, it's the opposite, different altogether. So this is the New, New Horizons spacecraft that flew to Pluto, but on its way to Pluto, it passed by Jupiter, and they took a snapshot of the night side, and easy, they found lightning. And of course, now we have Juno, Juno is orbiting continuously the planet. It has a camera, it has antenna, it has many sensing devices, and it picks up a lot of signals. We call those signals whistlers, because if you translate the electromagnetic signal into an acoustic sound, you hear like a whistle. It's not real. It's just taking the same distribution of intensity from the electromagnetic or visible representation into an acoustical one. But basically, this is what we see. A lot of lightning. 400 lightning during eight orbits. So this is a considerable amount. And we see them everywhere, even in northern latitude. Don't go into too much technical information. but. We are 
pretty confident that there are a lot of lightning in this helium hydrogen atmosphere occurring in water clouds and most recently a paper published three years ago new discovery they also occur on ammonia clouds upper in the atmosphere and there these types of lightning are what we call shallow electrical storms they are not energetic and and so I know the authors of, of this paper let me show you uh, a short video they produced from all the data that they uh, collected and with some artistic freedom created this video let's hope it works connection is there YouTube is there no <laughs> uh, that's, uh, let's try again I don't know what's going on today no wouldn't let me ah yes okay have patience yeah let's see I hope it runs uh, music by Vangelis you know uh, shallow lighting of Jupiter so should be beautiful and if not then if it's not running just uh, less than a minute but I think there's some value in watching it uh, I don't know some network issues this morning no I apologize sorry go back okay so when I send you the file you can log on and see the video it's beautiful so the sister planet of Jupiter is of course Saturn the Lord of the Rings the original Lord of the Rings not one we know precious my precious <laughs> anyway uh, Voyager passed by Jupiter in 79 and by Saturn two years later and uh, the, the, the cameras did not see any optical images however the, the sensors the remote sensing antenna immediately detected what was then called Saturn electromagnetic discharges SED and people were not sure what the source was so they did some computation and they thought it comes from the ring the rings of the planet yeah there are a bunch of rings which are composed of ice particles moonlets and small ice particles and uh, the expectation was that if those collide with each other they may generate electricity that will emit those signals uh, and they were picked up by Voyager 1 Voyager 2 and when Cassini came years later in 2006 to study the atmosphere of Titan and to do imaging of the Saturnian satellite system it picked up many many signals and then when they did this backtracking it was clearly evident that those signals did not come from the rings they came from deep inside the planet so thunderstorms again were found and um, some of the storm were with an immense flash rate huge flash rate and then there's a quiet period and then then another storm erupts so it's not continuous like on earth where you have lightning all the time it's a seasonal thing on Saturn that part of the time there are active storms and part of the time it's not and uh, I skip this and I so we all waited for okay there are storms on Saturn will we ever see light from a lightning and uh, Uliana a colleague from JPL jump that's in Pasadena California NASA Jet Propulsion Lab she did uh, analysis of Cassini images of the night side you have to understand you're looking for a needle in a haystack because you get tens and tens of thousands of images from the planet and then you have to go one by one like you did when you look for blue discharges and maybe find light 
in the darkness of the night side of Saturn, and she found uh, several bright spots, and they appeared in a storm system that was easily uh, locatable. So they were not meteors, not ball lights. This was the real deal. This was lightning, and it was in the storm that was deduced from the electromagnetic signals. So pretty confident lightning is there. And then came the magnificent storm of 2011. It was called the dragon that ate its tail. It was like uh, the storm, by the way, first detected by an amateur astronomer who saw this white cloud appear and he told NASA and they put the Hubble to look at, at the storm and the storm erupted and the clouds drifted so quickly that they caused this massive 10,000 kilometers long storm system. Okay, and the flash rate was so high it saturated the, the machine, the receiver. There was continuous lightning and when they did the calculation of the energy, that was 10,000 times stronger than on Earth. They were super, super bolts. Really ferocious lightning on that planet. And Oliana worked a little more on those specific lightning and she published a paper that they were bluish in color. Because hydrogen, if you excite it and hit it, it emits in blue, 470 nanometer. So, and the flash is 200 kilometers large. The light comes out of the clouds into space. So this was a concrete evidence that we have lightning there in both giant planets we have clouds. The question is, do we have biology? Nobody knows. However, we can do experiments in the lab. Nobody did that before. And if you want a career in exobiology, it's an open field to search for biological signature of extraterrestrial. No, that's not extraterrestrial planetary lightning. Okay, so to make things shorter, we flew above Uranus in uh, 1986. We were able to pick up some signal, what we call Uranian electro -discharge, electrostatic discharges. Mm, maybe Uranian lightning, we didn't see light, no optical detection, no other types of Whistler, like the signature of lightning in magnetic signals, so we're not sure about Uranus. And we went by Neptune as well. We detected some signals uh, that may be interpreted as lightning. So let's talk about the summary. So just before I jump to the summary. Uh, we only had a very limited amount of time to spend near Uranus and Neptune, but we still got some data. The interpretation of the data is complex. Some experts believe possibly lightning generated radio emissions. Others repeat, say, could be something else. Most likely this is the logical explanation because if we found it on Jupiter and Saturn, and Uranus and Neptune are also gas giants, similar composition of the atmosphere, similar dynamics, probably storms and clouds there as well. Probably we can expect lightning there, but uh, still an open question. So the summary of this part before I finish is there, there are sprites in Jovian and Saturnian planets. They are extremely energetic. They occur in deep clouds, but also maybe in ammonia clouds. The rate is unknown. 
maybe seasonal like on Saturn, maybe continuous like on Jupiter. And they, um, the, we can assume that the charging process are like thunderstorms on Earth. So for the last part, I want to show you the way we approach the issue of detecting lightning on another planet if the clouds are too deep to obscure the light. Because if the cloud is so deep and dense, the photons will be absorbed and nothing will escape into the sensor that you have in orbit. And I propose that maybe we should not look for the lightning. Let's look for the sprites, because sprites occur in the mesosphere, high above the lightning, like we saw on Earth. And we did a theoretical calculation and published a paper uh, saying that uh, for the clouds of Saturn and Jupiter, there will be sprites there, because we know there are lightning for sure. And even for Venus, if there would be a hypothetical lightning on Venus, we may be able to see a Venusian sprite. And my PhD student, Daria, did a laboratory experiment because in a parallel logical approach, as NASA did when it started simulating planetary lightning, the Bill Buruki uh, paper that I showed you, I was asking myself, what would their color be? On Earth, they are red and blue sometimes because Earth's atmosphere contains nitrogen and oxygen. But what color will they look like on Jupiter or on Saturn and maybe Venus? So we built this uh, sprite chamber, but not in my laboratory. I did not have that sophisticated equipment. It was done the physics department in the University of Eindhoven. And Daria went there with her baby. Actually, she was a young mother. But the Dutch team was very gracious and they accepted her and had a daycare center to take care of the baby that she would be dedicated to science. And she was able to do those experiments. We had like bottles with the gas mixture for the different planets. And she used their high speed camera to look for how would Sprite potentially look like on Earth, on Venus, and in Jupiter. And you can see that uh, this is artificial MATLAB color, not true color. But there we were looking at the morphology of the discharge, how the tendrils would look like. And on Venus, they are more hairy, like a fur. And in Jupiter also, different and a little fuzzy because hydrogen and CO2 behave differently, electrically speaking. And uh, so we published this paper, great work. And um, so one would expect to look for sprites on other planets. Uh, and I should have uploaded another slide that last year, the Juno team from Jupiter reported they discovered elves in Jupiter. Still in debate, but the paper was published. They, sh they saw high above the clouds a, a spark of light in what theory predicted would be the, the emission line of an elf, and they saw it uh, in uh, Jupiter. So I think it's, it's a nice example that physics behaves the same everywhere. And you can use what you know on Earth to predict stuff elsewhere. And even this is now being attempted. Tying back to the question at the beginning of my talk, why should we talk about lightning on other planets? Because we are searching for life in our solar system and in other solar systems. And as I mentioned, lightning plays a role. So Christiane Helling from used to be in St. Andrews University in Scotland, but now uh, in Austria, in Graz. 
So she looked at uh, the potential of clouds, but not clouds that we are familiar uh, with, but clouds made of silicates. Her idea was, let's look at a brown dwarf or a planet which is much hotter than normally had been discussed so far. Will there be mineral dust clouds in the atmosphere of that planet? And they would be made of silicates and iron and aluminum, all kinds of materials we are not used to think of of cloud making materials. And so she did those numerical computation. We know the physics. We can mimic the electrical charging. We can mimic the production of lightning. And her conclusion was that, uh, yes, there can be lightning in exoplanetary rocky atmospheres. Does this relate in any way to the biology question that I asked? Probably not. Because if you don't need, if you don't have the ingredients for life to begin with, then no matter how much electricity you pump in the atmosphere, you will get nothing. So, but theoretically, there will be lightning there as well. So it's a matter of uh, just confirming this theory. And uh, I'll sit back and come to, to conclude this part of my talk. Uh, so you've seen that we know, but we have very large gaps in knowledge. Even in planets that are closest to us, we're still not sure, like Venus and Mars. And we don't understand the dynamics and the microphysics of clouds that are not on this planet. And uh, I think I may propose a, a new research to do a simulation of, of clouds on exoplanets that are more Earth-like, not rocky with uh, mineral clouds, but with water clouds, but in different gravity, different temperature, we'll see, not crystallized yet. So there are many unknowns, and this is a ripe field for research because it addresses Indirectly, of course, one of the basic questions I posed when I began today's talk is how life formed in the universe. So to sum up, definitely exists lightning on these planets. Venus, maybe, not sure. Uranus and Neptune partially confirmed, but not optically. Mars, Titan. Theoretically possible, not yet observed. Exoplanets, yes, maybe. And of course, to answer Drake's question, will if there is an exoplanet with lightning and biology, will they ever phone home? ET phone home? I don't know. Well, thank you. Okay, so we finished, and uh, maybe I'll try running this movie. Oh, it's running now. This is the simulation of the Juno lightning storms in Jupiter based on data and some animation. So it's as if we're flying into the thunderstorm. I'm not sure you're seeing it very well. Are you able to see this? Yeah rapidly growing thunder clouds and they are becoming charged really quickly and and have lightning nice okay so let's take a break lunch break for one hour and when we come back from lunch uh, we'll summarize the entire course and I'll give you the floor for each team uh, to maybe come up and show and share us this uh, lightning across the solar system. Uh, share with us their results and findings and thoughts. And then we will give you, I think Vasha will be handing you the certificate. And then you can go home. Okay? So thank you. Take a break.